Thank you very much, sir. Even great men have their poor relations. Very, very good. God bless you, sir. You're a gentleman. A very perfect gentleman knight. Geoffrey Chaucer. sir. Oh, thank you, sir. Oh, verily, my cup run it over. May your sweetness never blush unseen. My gratitude knows no bounds, sir. Here I sit, your slave, poor, infirm, weak and despised. William Shakespeare. <laughs> oh, you're a gentleman, sir, and so was he. <laughs> Blessed are the poor in spirit, sir. Blessed are the poor in spirit. For yours is the kingdom of heaven, sir. Supper at my club. Yes, he did mention it to me this morning. It was just before the lady called. Lady? Which lady? Well, I, I don't know her name, but uh, the lady called and Mr. Holmes went out. Hmm. In that case, I should take advantage of an early night. Oh, I must answer the door. Of course. It might be a clue. mind, I'm sure. He's the kindest of men. Mrs. Whitney to see you, Doctor. Kate, this is a surprise. Not a pleasant one, I fear, John. Thank you, Mrs. Hudson. Uh, perhaps some tea? That would be most welcome. You must forgive me for causing so much trouble. Oh, you're causing us no trouble at all. Please. Your assistant told me that you were Dining with Mr. Holmes. Oh, I see. You, you've been to the surgery. And you had just left. Well, Mr. Holmes has disappeared without trace, as you can see. In that case, I really shouldn't bother you with my problems. Oh, Mr. Holmes disappears without trace at regular intervals. There's really no cause for alarm, only curiosity. But, um, why did you want to see me? If you're ill, you should not be travelling across London. I am not ill. It's Isa. Isa is ill, I can visit him at home. He is not at home. He too has disappeared without trace. You can probably guess what he's doing. Mm. I imagine he's indulging his addiction. Opium? I fear so. Well, he's done this before, has he not? What makes this circumstance so very different? Normally, his... Orgies are confined to one day. He leaves the house in the morning and returns in the evening, pale and shattered. And this time? I have not seen Isa for 48 hours. Have you the remotest idea where he might be? There is an establishment called the Bar of Gold in Upper Swandham Lane. I believe he is there. But I dare not go there alone. Oh, no, no, no respectable woman would go within a hundred miles of that vile alley unaccompanied. Will you come with me? No. Oh, but... No, I shall go there on my own. You will go home, and if your husband is where you think he is, I guarantee to have him back with you within two hours. Though I dare not imagine what state he'll be in. Your tea, Doctor. 
My apologies, Mrs. Hudson. I shall not require tea. I'm going out. But uh, Mrs. Whitney will take tea. And what am I to tell Mr. Holmes? Should he return? Tell him I've disappeared without trace. Up a Swandham Lane, please, cabby. I sometimes wonder whether men ever really, truly grow up. They seem to remain little boys forever. Do you wonder about that, Mrs. Hudson? No, Mrs. Whitney, I don't wonder about it. I know it. And they always need us to kiss them better afterwards. <laughs> In a manner of speaking, of course. wish to speak to Mr. Isa Whitney. I thought it was Wednesday. <laughs> it is Wednesday. <laughs> you, you're trying to frighten me. Your wife has been waiting for you to return home for two days. Two? Hey, sure not. A few hours, perhaps. Three pipes. Four pipes. I forget. Outside, you're going home now. Uh, I my friendship, my wife's love. Uh, uh, oh, okay. Uh, Come on. Uh, I have to play. <laughs> I have the manager on Monday. You have to pay for your own destruction. I'll see to it. Just get out of this dreadful place. Let go. Let go. 
your hands off. Holmes. What on earth are you doing in this den? I can't get about my business. You have a cab outside. Yeah. I press into him. He looks too little to get into any kind of mischief. I'll see you in five minutes. All right. the house. Holmes! Hi, sir. I'm certainly surprised to see you in that place. I suppose you think I've added opium to smoking to all my other little weaknesses. I merely said I was surprised to see you there. As indeed I was to see you. I was searching for a friend. And I felt an enemy. An enemy? Had I been recognized in that place, my life would not have been worth an hour's purchase. John! I'm in the midst of the most remarkable inquiry. I hope you're not smoking the substance in that pipe, Holmes. Only to the extent necessary to merge with the surroundings. I'm off to leave. In Kent. Are you coming? Of course. <laughs> I think we should be safe now, Watson. Would you take the reins? Where exactly are we going? The Cedars, a lovely villa near Lee in Kent. May I ask why I'm going to Lee in Kent in the middle of the night on a Friday in March? Because you are my trusty comrade and my loyal chronicler, I may need both. Here are the facts, as I understand. Several years ago, there came to Lee in Kent a gentleman by name Neville St. Clair. He took a large villa, the Cedars, and about a year later, married the daughter of a local brewer. They have two small children. He has interests in several companies and travels to the city every morning, returning by the 514 train from Cannon Street every night. He is a man of temperate habits, a good husband, an affectionate father, and is popular with all who know him. His debts, as far as we can ascertain, about 88 pounds and 10 shillings, while he has 220 pounds to his credit in the capital and counties bank. Therefore, there is no reason to think that money troubles have been weighing down. A veritable paragon. What, sir? There's a hint of skepticism in your voice, which does you no credit. I expect Mrs. Sinclair came to you saying that her husband had disappeared. Exactly. Well, well it seems to be a continuous thread in life's fabric. What, sir, what is that? I shall ignore your air of resignation to the world's frailties and continue. Right. Oh, please, do. On Monday, St. Clair left for the city as usual. Before he left, he promised that he would bring home a box of building bricks for his children. Building bricks? Mark that well, Watson. Soon after he left, Mrs. St. Clair received a telegram to say that a parcel of considerable value had arrived for her at the offices of the Aberdeen Shipping Company. She decided to travel to the city, collect her parcel, have lunch, and do some shopping. It was by chance that she found herself in Upper Swandham Lane, that same vile alley that we both visited this evening, Watson. And it was at this point that something quite singular took place.
Where are you going? I'm going upstairs. There's nobody upstairs. I saw my husband waving from an upstairs window. There is nobody upstairs. I saw him. I know my own husband. What's he doing here? There is nobody upstairs. Oh! Neville! They threw her out. They did. Blackout. The Malay and the Lasker, who owns the establishment. A man of the vilest antecedents and a murderer into the bar. A murderer, yet he goes free. <laughs> the rear of the building backs on to the river. There's even a convenient trap door for the disposal of bodies. Why don't the police arrest these two men? Watson, the police have arrested a cripple. cripple? <laughs> There's so much more yet to tell you, but here we are at the Cedars. Thank you. Any news? Mrs. Sinclair, I thought you'd be asleep. Sleep does not come easily at a time like this. This is my friend and colleague, Dr. Watson, who has kindly agreed to help me in my investigation. Mr. Holmes has spoken of you. Mrs. Sinclair? I have taken the liberty of asking the doctor to stay overnight. And I took the liberty of preparing a little cold supper. Dr. Watson, you take my place. Oh, no, really. Uh, Watson, Mrs. Sinclair is a very strong-willed woman. You refuse her at your peril. Thank you. Now, Mr. Sherlock Holmes, before we eat, I should like to ask one or two plain questions, to which I should like plain answers. Certainly, madam. Do you, in your heart of hearts, think that Neville is still alive? Frankly, now, I'm not hysterical, nor am I given to fainting. Frankly, then, I do not. You think he is dead? I do. Murdered? I don't say that. Perhaps. And on what day did he meet his death? On Monday. So then how do you explain that I received a letter from him today, being Friday? Mrs. St. Clair, I wonder if you would do me a favor. By all means. I have told Dr. Watson what happened up to the moment when you were ejected from that building. Would you tell us what happened subsequently, please? For Dr. Watson's benefit? And for mine. I, too, have to re-examine the facts as we know them. Now, if you're not too tired. Of course. As you may imagine, I do not take kindly to being forcibly removed from a building. I sought and found police help. Two constables and Inspector... Bradstreet. Bradstreet. And then you returned to the building? Yes. The period of time between these two visits was? About 20 minutes. By the time we returned, the door was unbolted. Though I am sure the Lasker had bolted it when I left earlier. I want to look at your upstairs rooms. There's nobody there. There's nobody there. You can't objectify. Look. You two men stay here. He was in this room. Time and again, I tell you, there's nobody here. May we look in that room? You mustn't be worried by this gentleman, Mrs. Sinclair. He is an old friend of the constabulary. <laughs> you know, Inspector, according to W.S. Gilbert, a policeman's lot is not a happy one. <laughs> Mr. Boone is a professional beggar. No, not a beggar. An honest trader. <laughs> Does this man lodge here? Yes. You told me nobody lived here. Madam! A beggar is nobody. If you have prickers, do we not bleed? 
Shakespeare, Mr. Boone. I know that one. You've told it to me before. <laughs> Inspector. The big attempt is Sinclair. The large window. Miss Sinclair. A window and a river in close proximity does not automatically mean violent death. You've been here in the past hour? Yes. Anyone else been here? Alas, no. I've been as lonely as a cloud. Tennyson. Oh, Wordsworth, <laughs> Inspector. <laughs> standing here. I saw him. Mrs. Sinclair, there is no evidence to suggest that he was ever here. Building bricks, Inspector. So I see you. My husband left for the city this morning, and the last thing he said to me was that he had to buy some building bricks for our little girl's birthday. I see. Either of you gentlemen buy building bricks? <laughs> <laughs> Somebody must have left them. <laughs> and these are my husband's clothes. Shall I describe them to you in detail as you examine them? My husband's tailor's name is Smart. If you care to examine the label. At that moment, Inspector Bradstreet began to believe my story. He and his men made an extensive search of the building. They found a blood stain up on the windowsill. They searched the Malay, the Lasker, and Boone, but found nothing. They failed to find my husband's overcoat. No. Overcoat? The one item of clothing that was not accounted for. Until low tide. It's heavy, sir. Weighted down with something. There were 421 pennies, 270 halfpennies stuffed into every pocket of the overcoat. Your conclusion, Watson. Speak freely, Dr. Watson. I've lived with every possibility this past week, however hideous. Well, um, the murderer must have been Boone the beggar. Who else could have access to uh, such a vast number of pennies and halfpennies? That is the conclusion reached by the police. They've arrested Boone. He is presently in Bow Street Police Station. Even though my husband is still alive. Now, Mrs. Sinclair, let us re-examine the significance of this letter. May I read it to Dr. Watson? By all means. Dearest, uh, do not be frightened. There is a huge error which it may take some little time to rectify. Wait in patience, Neville. Written in pencil on the flyleaf of a book, octavo size, no watermark. Posted in Gravesend by a man with a dirty thumb. This is not your husband's writing. No. But the note is. Without question. It's the hand he always used when he was in a hurry. Whoever gummed down the envelope had, unless I am very much in error, been chewing tobacco. It is a trifle, of course, Watson. But there's nothing so important as trifles. Mrs. Sinclair, the 
was an enclosure. Signet ring. Hmm. Mrs. Sinclair, has your husband ever spoken of the power of gold and other swandam lane? Never. I suspect that Dr. Watson has a question to put to you. Um, this is a difficult question to ask, Mrs. Sinclair, but um, has your husband ever shown any signs of taking opium? You always appeared perfectly normal. Though I confess I would not recognize the signs. What are they? Uh, listlessness, a lack of energy, an inability to concentrate, a general air of apathy. Dr. Watson is a specialist in uncontrolled addiction. My husband was not an opium addict. That's to say, is not an opium addict. Mr. Holmes, I know you think my husband is dead. I fully realize that letter could have been written on Monday and only posted today. I know the circumstances as they have been described lead to the inescapable conclusion that he has been murdered. But equally, I know that he is alive. There is such a keen bond of sympathy between us. I should know if evil came. Watson, if Mills and Clare is alive and well, why doesn't he come home and demonstrate the fact? Presumably because he's not alive and well. Yes, but this letter could have been written at any time. Perhaps um, under duress. It could even be a skillful forgery. And the signet ring? Easily removed. Especially if the victim is dead. Indeed. Proceeding on the hypothesis that Neville St. Clair is dead, how did he meet his death? Well, clearly he was murdered. By whom? Well, the police think it was this chap, Booth. I see no reason to disagree with the police. Except? Except what? You say he's a cripple? Yes. How severe is his disability? It's only a slight limb. Well, my medical experience tells me that when there is a weakness in one limb, it's very often compensated for by exceptional strength in the others. You're not convinced. This man is a professional beggar. He's well known in the city. He's well liked in the city. I've seen him many times. He has a remarkable faculty for repartee with which he delights his many clients. Well, he sounds harmless. Why therefore did the police arrest him rather than the Lascar? That is the very question that I put to Inspector Bradstreet. No, no. Murder has obviously been committed by a process of elimination. Boone must be the murderer. Are these Neville St. Clair's clothes? Hmm. Why did you eliminate the Lasker as a suspect? Because Mrs. St. Clair saw her husband in an upstairs window, apparently in the middle of a struggle. She went to a downstairs door and was confronted by the Lasker. While they were conversing, you ought to be more precise. While the Lasker and his assistant were ejecting Mrs. Sinclair from the building, the fight was proceeding upstairs, leading, as we now know, to the death of Neville Sinclair. A 21st birthday present. A man of meticulous habits, no scratches. What was the motive in killing Sinclair? It remains to be established. Not a trace of opium. Could it have been robbery? No. No, St. Clair's wallet was in his pocket. Well, the money untouched. 
How'd you explain the coins? The mere of hmm. I cannot truly answer that, Mr. Holmes. Let me try. Boone kills St. Clair. He removes the outer garments, hoping to capitalize on them and their contents. He lifts the body, carries it across the room, forces it through the open window, hence the abrasion. Blood upon the window sill. Mm. He releases it into the river. Where it's sucked away by the tide. In the midst of this activity, he hears the scuffle downstairs as Mrs. St. Clair tries to force her way in. There's not a moment to be lost. You must dispose of the clothing. He starts with the overcoat. He realizes at once it will float and not sink. So what does he do? He rushes across the room to some secret hoard where he's accumulated the fruits of his beggary, stuffs all the coins that he can lay his hands on into the pockets of the overcoat, and drops it into the water. And would presumably have done the same with the other garments if you and your men had bought a raft. <laughs> Seals the other garments behind the curtain in the hope they'll not be noticed, and they would not have been noticed had Mrs. Sinclair not been so persistent. Inspector, whatever plot has been hatched in that opium den, I cannot but imagine that the Lasker is not somehow involved. I was sorely tempted to arrest him on the day. I'll send a couple of men up there now. No, um, Inspector. With your permission. May I suggest an alternative strategy? By all means. Let me visit the opium den. Discreetly. Incognito. We shall learn what we may. But what did you learn? Nothing. Everybody, as far as I can ascertain, appears to be telling the truth. I, I cannot see an overall pattern. Can you see a pattern, Watson? No, oh, I see no pattern. But I do see a woman who, despite all objective circumstances, still believes that her husband is alive. And, and you've said on many occasions that the impression of a woman may be more valuable than the conclusion of an analytical reasoner. But if he is still alive, where is he? I have no idea, but I do have an urgent request. It's now well past four in the morning. May I go to sleep? Certainly. Thank you.
Watson. Watson. What time is it? Dawn. Uh, I've only had two hours sleep. I wonder if you do me the very great kindness of considering the possibility of waking up. I, I assume you have a good reason. Are you game for the drive? Certainly, but does it have to be this early? I have a little theory I wish to test. Is anyone's life at stake? Certainly not. Would it be possible to test your theory a little later this morning? I'll see you downstairs in five minutes. Five minutes. Come on, Nelson. You have the grand gift of silence, Watson. It makes you quite invaluable as a companion. Watson, you're in the presence of one of the most absolute fools in Europe. I think you exaggerate. I deserve to be kicked from here to Charing Cross. Why wouldn't you woke me up? I would have been. I've got the key, to... Watson, here in this Gladstone bag. Good morning, gentlemen. Watson, I confess I've been as blind as a mole. But it's better to learn wisdom late than never to learn it at all. Bradstreet. Bradstreet. I called about that beggar man, Boone. He's in the cells, Mr. Holmes. What can I do for you? I should very much like to see him. He'll probably be asleep. Most of the population is probably asleep, Holmes. Very well, Mr. Holmes. Dr. Watson, if you come this way. Can you go back in the office, Mr. Holmes? I'll take it with me. It contains the key. He's a dirty scoundrel. Filthy. Refuses to wash. Says washing weakens a man's resistance. Asleep. He's a beauty, isn't he? Inspector, would you do me the great goodness of opening the door as quietly as possible? Gentlemen, let me introduce you to Mr. Neville St. Clair of Lee in the county of Kent. Great heaven. It is true. And pray, what am I being charged with? Charged with making away with Mr. Neville St. Clair. Making away with myself? in the force of 27 years. This takes the cake. But since it is obvious that no crime has been committed, I am illegally detained. 
My strength is as the strength of ten, because my heart is pure. <laughs> Alfred Lord Tennyson. <laughs> you lied to your wife, Mr. Sinclair. Is that purity? that I would have endured imprisonment, even execution, rather than reveal my miserable secret to my wife and children. All is now revealed, Mr. Sinclair. So be it. My father was a schoolmaster in Chesterfield. I received an excellent education, traveled, took to the stage, and finally became a reporter on a London newspaper. One day, my editor wished to have a series of articles upon begging in the metropolis, and I volunteered to supply them. So you became a beggar? Yes. And your experience as an actor must have proved invaluable. Yes. Exactly. Yes, I painted my face to make myself look as pitiable as possible. I manufactured frightening scars. I twisted my lip with the aid of a piece of flesh-colored plaster. And then with a dark wig and appropriate clothing, took my position in the busiest part of the metropolis, ostensibly as a match seller, but yes, really as a beggar. And you did well? Yes. In one day, I took 26 shillings and four pence. I wrote my articles for the newspaper. My editor was delighted, and I thought no more about it. Until one day, I backed a bill for a friend of mine. I had a writ served on me for 25 pounds. Well, I was at my wit's end. I mean, what could I do? And then suddenly an idea came to me. I asked for a fortnight's holiday from my employers and spent the time in the city begging. In 10 days, I had the money and was able to pay back the debt. That was when I fell into the trap. How much were you earning from the newspaper at this time? Two pounds a week. Far less than begging. Yeah. During the last few years, I have earned on average at least 700 pounds a year. It's a gentleman's income. Calm, Bradstreet. I think it is pertinent to say that Mr. Sinclair is no ordinary beggar. People do not expect a beggar to quote extensively from Shakespeare, Mr. Dickens, the Bible, or the latest popular songs. An aristocrat among beggars. Well, it is not for me to claim such a distinction, but as the inspector rightly observes, I had a gentleman's income, so I proceeded to live like a gentleman. I, I bought a villa in Kent. I married a beautiful and respectable woman. And every morning I traveled to my business in the city. You must have been embroiled with Alaska by this time. Yes, I paid him a generous rent for the use of his upstairs rooms. My secret was safe with him. I fell among thieves, but found honor of a sort. You see, every morning I would emerge as a squalid beggar and every evening transformed into a gentleman. Tell us about Monday. I had finished for the day and was dressing in my room above the opium den 
and suddenly I looked out of the window. To my horror and astonishment, there was my wife in the street, her eyes fixed full upon me. I, I, I ran along to try and find Lasko. You must not let her in. I'll say there's nobody upstairs. She may return with the police. I'll tell them there's nobody upstairs. Mr. Boone will be upstairs. Ah, Mr. Boone is a lodger. He has a right to be upstairs. Rebo! I then became Boone, the beggar, once more. And then it occurred to me that there might be a search of the room and that my clothes might betray me. So I picked up my coat, which was weighed down with the coins that I had just transferred from my leather bag in which I carried my takings. The rest of my clothes would have followed, but at that moment, the police arrived. The rest you know. We found blood on the windowsill. In, in my haste to open the window, I cut myself. A minor abrasion, but if you prick me. And thus I was arrested on suspicion of having murdered myself. And thus you caused your wife much anguish. But I wrote her a letter. And gave it to the Lasker to post. Yes. It was not delivered. It arrived yesterday. He probably gave it to one of his sailor customers. I shall never forgive myself the agony which I have inflicted upon my wife. Can I go to her now? I think we must impose one condition, Mr. Sinclair. Anything. There must be no more of you, Boone. I swear it by the most solemn oath that a man can take. Sweet Boone, a flight of angels sing thee to thy rest. William Shakespeare. 